Um, so here's a question, you know, it, are they just dying, or is this delirium? Um, and actually, I think I, I started to address this in two different places. So um, the question is, so the key thing is, what is their trajectory? And is the, so if someone, a lot of the time we see someone who's declining and declining, they get to a point where they're, they stop eating and drinking and they're pretty much bed bound and, they're, and, and, then, and then they get to a point where they're confused and delirious and they pass away. Well, then the hypoactive delirium is not necessarily, that, that's a part of the dying process. And that's not necessarily something you want to do about it. I still think it is very valuable to do at least a good assessment and at least thinking through and maybe doing some of the interventions like simplifying medications and stopping any potentially problematic medications and things like that. But we're going to be different with that than if someone is going along and, you know, they're ups and downs, but, you know, they're suddenly they're significantly worse, significantly more confused and not eating and drinking. And, well, maybe if you can fix that confusion and get them eating and drinking, they will be back to their baseline again. And so, again, that's why I encourage for all of these that we go, we, we do an evaluation. Um, now, obviously, if there's distressing symptoms, we're going to be medicated. Hydration may be helpful. To go from there. So, okay, we're thinking this may be delirium of any type, dying not. What do we do? Well, I think it's good to, you know, go and evaluate the patient. Obviously, in the middle of the night, maybe you will, you, you'll just start somehow. I don't know how much a thorough evaluation necessarily has to be, depending on how active it is and how distressing the person, distressing it is. But I think we need to be out there within a very, very limited amount of time and actually looking at the patient, talking to the family. So again, finding their baseline mental status is important. There've been a lot of patients I have talked to, or a lot of times I saw patients in the hospital setting where. I, it says on the HMP severe or end stage dementia or something like that. Talk to the family. No, a week ago they were talking and they were fine. They're just forgetful. It said Alzheimer's on their chart. They come in, they're completely out of their mind. They can barely talk, and so they write down end stage dementia. No, it was not end stage dementia. It is some early Alzheimer's with delirium. And so finding out what their baseline is. On the other hand, if they're thoroughly confused at baseline, and we get them back to thoroughly confused. Well, that may be, you know, we, we have to be aware we're not going to fix that <laughs> if that's their baseline. Um, <clears throat> what are their, uh, you know, have there been any changes at all recently? Um, were medications changed? Did they suddenly stop something? They suddenly, um, for whatever reason, did they suddenly start something? Was there a big change in what they've been eating and what, how they've been eat, uh, drinking? Um, anything else like that? Have they been giving a lot more PRNs? Um, that may be contributing? Was there a big fall where they hit their head? Um, the bowels, bladder, um, are they having any other symptoms that they're complaining of? Pain. And then my clonus, and I'll touch on this again, is something that is helpful. That is the sudden jerking. It can be quite subtle. Um, sometimes I'll notice it when I'm holding someone's hand. It's just kind of a little twitching in the hand. Um, uh, sometimes, um, sometimes it will be quite dramatic. Yeah, the whole body will do that, although that's less common, and a lot of the time, any more dramatic jerking is as they're going off to sleep. And so we're in there, we're talking to them, we're keeping them awake, it's less likely to, but I've found that a tremendous amount of time, the family and or the patient will tell me, oh yes, that has been a major issue that's been for this period of time, and then you can try to assess whether that may be a clue to what's going on, and I'll get to that later. All right. Physical examination, vital signs. Oh, do they have a fever? They're very tachycardic. If they have a pulse of, actually, an elevated pulse of any reason may be a sign. You know, if they have a pulse of 110 or 120, it may be dehydration. If they have a pulse of 150, 180, that may be a cardiac abnormality. We've had two patients recently, or three even, I think, that, yeah, at least three recently, that have had a very rapid heart rate, or and one with a very slow heart rate, which was harder to treat. but. Um, but by managing the heart rate and getting that down to a more reasonable rate, they felt much, much better, and it can directly impact on mental status. Um, are they breathing really fast? Well, that might mean that they're um, having some issues with, um, with lungs. It's a pulse ox low. Hypoxia, cause delirium. 
They have, tr they have a big bruise on their head. Well, maybe no one noticed if they fall, but they have a subdural hematoma. Maybe we want to do something about it, maybe we don't, but at least it's something we need to know about so we can figure out um, what they want to do. Do they have, are their eyes bright yellow? Is their mouth really dry? Or do they have all kinds of sores, so maybe they haven't been drinking because they have severe thrush? Um, are their lungs sounding like there's an ammonia or it's full of CHF? Um, is their abdomen showing that they've got, um, they're full of stool or their bladder's distended or perhaps absolutely no bowel sounds, although, you know, whether there's a little bit or a lot is usually not all that helpful or how many quadrants it's in. Um, you know, it's a rectum full of stool. Now, one caveat on that is there have been times when I have seen someone who, you know, they've, they've given set a number of things from below and they've gotten some decent output. Um, and so the patient's not constipated, right? Well, you get an x-ray and their entire colon is full, is like this big and full of stuff all the way around until you get to the rectum and then that's been cleaned out. So you stick your finger in there, okay, there's nothing there. Well, that's not adequate. That's one of the reasons that we want to get it from above and below is that, you know, below is going to get the rectum, but it's not going to get the whole colon if it's been a long time. So being aware of that, um, uh, you know, is there skin? wet, is it pale, is it yellow, um, or do they have a rash or infection on it, um, are their extremities, is there gangrene, are they mottled, um, <clears throat> neurologic, or they, they suddenly stop moving one side of their body. There have been a couple cases where I have actually been at least peripherally involved in where there were days, some, at least one point, it was four days between when the event almost certainly happened and when it was recognized that, oh, the patient can't move her lower extremities. Whoa, you know, if there's something going on, suddenly the person's not moving one side, um, suddenly a new facial droop, um, that, that may not, if someone's bed bound already, you may not really notice it, um, but that can be, it may be that there's a big stroke going on. Well, you know, maybe that will change our management, maybe it's not, but it's a good, it's, it's appropriate and important to recognize those things so we can um, be talking with the family and, and appropriately proceeding from there. Um, asterisk is, is a useful clue. It's not something you necessarily need to check for, but that's the, um, uh, you hold your hands out like this, your hands, they hold, they, they do this, <laughs> and, and you see the flapping. It's sometimes, sometimes it's fairly subtle with just some fingers, and sometimes it's that. That is a sign of liver disease with high ammonia and, and um, hepatic encephalopathy, so that can be a useful thing in some cases that that may be a clue. <clears throat> okay. Let's get, why don't you guys give me some causes of delirium? What are some common causes of delirium? Dehydration. Dehydration, very good. Urinary tract. Urinary tract infection. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Medication changes. What? Medication changes. Sure, yes, um, absolutely. So starting new medications, stopping them, absolutely. Constipation. Constipation, you guys are all over some of the key ones here. Hypoxia. Hypoxia, very good, very good. And more. These are some of the biggest, most common ones, certainly. I don't want to jump out with any... Yes, do those and you're doing pretty well, Sleep I'll say. That can certainly contribute to it. Um, it certainly can. Sleep disturbance patterns. And if you keep someone's sleep deprived long enough, then they will, anyone will eventually become delirious. Um, and that's one of the ways of torturing someone. Another one we'll talk about in a minute. But this is a little mnemonic. I don't know that it's um, actually all that helpful for people. But if you want to, um, drugs, D for drugs, um, which could be starting them or stopping them. Usually the stopping is just very limited, but at stopping a benzodiazepine suddenly, cold turkey, if they've been on it forever, um, maybe steroids, um, um, maybe opiates, certainly alcohol. Um, if you're stopping those suddenly, that can cause delirium. And any, almost any of them that are started, and some of them that have, may have been going on for a while, may become a problem if there's uh, something else um, that may be contributing. E for endocrine or electrolyte abnormalities, and in the electrolytes we're including dehydration. There's several different electrolytes that can do this. Hypo, hyperthyroidism can do that as well, which is the endocrine part. Low oxygen, um, hypoxia, liver failure. Um, Infections, UTIs, pneumonias. Um, this is an interesting one. Reduced sensory input. Again, if, if I took you and put you in a sensory deprivation chamber, every single person here would, would before very long, become delirious. You'd be hallucinating. 
So you take someone who may not be completely quite all there, a little bit of cognitive impairment, and you take away their glasses so they can't see, and you put them in a dark room, and you take away their hearing aids, or their hearing aid doesn't work, or their you stuff their ears with wax so their wax is there's wax in their ears. They're very likely to get um, uh, become. Uh, delirious. So it's actually ironic. Sometimes we want to keep everything dark and calm, and that may be appropriate, but sometimes that can actually worsen it. It may be if they're used to being in a house where the TV is always on, they may do much better with the TV on and with some lights on. This is probably one of the reasons that people sometimes do worse at night, with sleep being another another reason. Um, so, so. Intracranial problems, do they have mats, do they have a new stroke, is it meningitis, I'm not usually looking for meningitis, but um, urinary retention or fecal impaction, these are huge, number one cause of urinary retention is fecal impaction, so they, they often will go together, um, uh, so, but um, really, and being aware, it's not always just in the rectum, as I said. Um, and so again, when you're getting a history of the bowels, it may not be just when is the last bowel movement. Okay, you can go on. Okay, well, let me get a little bit before that. Has it been regular? Okay, well, no, we, this was because we gave a suppository an enema, but it really had been very little bit for three weeks before that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, myocardial problems, someone who has an MI, someone who suddenly has a fast arrhythmia, CHF, these can cause it. And then other predisposing factors, advanced age, if any reason will cause, is, is um, despite the fact that I've been accused of being an ageist for um, treating a 95-year-old different than I would a 45-year-old, they're not the same. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, cognitive impairment, even mild cognitive impairment, if they're just somewhat forgetful, they've not been diagnosed, that does set people up. Depression, interestingly, sets people up for it. And there are probably a few different reasons, partly because they may have cognitive impairment, which is contributing to depression. For whatever reason, that is seen as a predisposing factor, as well as issues of problems with seeing and hearing and all that. So those are um, some causes. I need to figure out what I did. I did this a little differently, so I'm in a little more trouble. Okay. Oh, again, this is this is kind of this is where I started doing this yesterday. But you know, but they're dying again. Delirium's common at the end of life, but delirium can cause the end of life. And this quote, all untreated delirium becomes terminal delirium if you don't, you know, if you don't treat it. So, is it, is it a part of a decline or is it cause of decline? And will fixing the reversible cause make a difference? But I recommend that everyone get at least that initial evaluation and the thought process before through, um, even if we're not necessarily going to do, do anything about that. So what do we do? Well, testing, we don't do a lot of labs. The urinalysis can be helpful. Honestly, I, and on the sheet it gives orders, on the orders, standing orders, it gives orders for you can do a urinalysis, and then if there's certain circumstances, like they've had antibiotics in the last month, they have instrumentation or um, something in their urinary tract, then you also get a culture. If they don't have any of those things and they have pretty clear symptoms, we don't even need to get a UA. Okay? If, we, if they have, you know, repeated UA or UTIs in the past, not really, really recent, but you know, they've gotten a few a year, and they have burning and um, you know, dysuria, and they have um, cramping, and they, they have urgency and frequency, and they're going frequent small amounts. Yeah, well, they have a urinary tract infection. They don't have a really high fever. They're not really sick. Just go ahead and treat them. You just put them on Bactrim, and, and that's fine, and that just saves everyone a hassle. Um, uh, um, See, uh, you can get um, these sometimes, again, checking for electrolytes can be helpful, sometimes a thyroid, sometimes you can get a CBC to look for signs of infection or something. Again, a lot of the time, this is, I have not found these to be especially helpful. Often, if you fix their hydration status, if you, if you are cons really concerned about electrolytes, and fixing the hydration status will often make a big difference on that anyway, so I'm not as worried about it. Chest x-ray, again, might be helpful if you're worried about it. Um, you know, is this CHF, is this pneumonia, is it, but a lot of the time, clinically, I, I don't worry about that. So, I don't do a lot of testing here. I think we really need to do a good evaluation, history, physical, and that, but that's the focus here. Um, 
once in a while, if you know there's trauma, we might or something we think there may be a bleed, we might consider something like this. Although, depending on what they want, if they really want it aggressively treated, they might even want to sign off with hospice. So that would be something. That would be a discussion. That would be rare in this case.